So I'm here with uh, Mel Ehrlich, who's a, a PhD in uh, physics. Ph physics. Um, you're one of the pioneers of the hydrogen bomb, is that correct? That's true, yes. Uh, and um, you want to tell me a little bit about uh, how you got involved with uh, that program? Sure. The, um, in the early 50s, uh, the first digital mainframe computer, Univac number two, was installed at NYU um, at Waverly Place and occupied uh, the entire first floor of, of a large building. Uh, the Univac II was uh, a vacuum tube machine and uh, using uh, mercury columns as a mercury column delay lines as a scratch pad memory. And uh, Univac II, <coughs> this digital computer, was the uh, supported by the Atomic Energy Commission. So a lot of the nuclear weapons development was done on this machine. This is also the first uh, computer software languages were developed for use on this machine. Some are still used today, namely uh, COBOL and FORTRAN. I worked on both those software programs. <coughs> wow. And the um, uh, and so. The computational facility required that uh, uh, that I travel. I was, went, used to go to Los Alamos, uh, Princeton, and many other universities. Uh, we, we'd get data. Uh, most of the data input to the machine was done by punch card, IBM punch card, and punch paper tape. Okay. Uh, it was quite a tour de force in its day in the early 50s. And how long uh, did that program uh, go on that you were involved with it? Uh, I was involved in it for almost 10 years. Okay. I was a graduate student and then um, I was fortunate enough to be um, invited to become a member of the uh, Institute of Applied Mathematics, uh, which uh, really ran the physics department at uh, NYU. Institute of Applied Mathematics was a uh, uh, the chair of the department was uh, Courant and uh, had notable mathematicians like uh, Friedrichs and uh, uh, Brad and a few other people of that ilk. And uh, uh, when Courant passed away, they renamed the, uh, the school to the Courant Institute of, of Mathematics. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so I was on, on staff. Uh, at the university, uh, and so this, I was completing my PhD, and uh, also interestingly enough, uh, in addition to working on uh, fusion, the military fusion devices, I was also working on the peaceful uses of atomic energy, namely uh, one project was called Project Sherwood, the other one that I worked on was Project Plowshare. Project Plowshare was a uh, concept of using, of building a uh, original concept that was, was to build a sea level canal across Honduras using nuclear weapons and nuclear devices, I should say weapons, nuclear devices to um, uh, blow a, 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 a canal right. across the isthmus with a bunch of shape charges. Uh -huh. And so a lot of theoretical work was done with that. Uh, another interesting application was something called Project Orion. Project Orion uh, was a, sp a uh, proposed spaceship, which was about as large as a uh, football field, oval-shaped, and uh, the uh, uh, idea of project of this type of spaceship was that around the circumference of this circular device was uh, a bunch of uh, nuclear 
devices which we dropped and then detonated to be a blade of shield underneath this and this was the apostatile spaceship to get it off the ground and actually a, a chemical model was built and demonstrated the feasibility of this um, and the other thing was Project Sherwood which was the controlled fusion uh, which would have a device which emulate, emulated the uh, way the sun operates in producing thermonuclear neutrons to generate electricity. Uh, the idea of the fusion was to take atoms of deuterium principally. Deuterium uh, has one electron and one proton and fuse them together to make helium. And when you fuse them together uh, in a thermonuclear reaction, uh, the difference in mass becomes energy using Einstein's formula E equals mc squared. Uh, and that energy uh, could be uh, an infinite supply of power all over the world using basically water. And uh, also the advantages of this type of device is there's no external radiation. So it's not like a uh, fission nuclear reactor which requires control rods and so on. Uh, this is a, uh, would be the, the <coughs> So what do you think is preventing that device from working today? Uh, people are still working on it using a Russian type of bottle called a tokamak and um, uh, and other people are working on it privately um, I think the oil interests uh, are impeding you know, people really throwing money at it to make it work and the uh, so I think that's what's impeding it Actually, the machine that I built uh, in the in the 50s, uh, <coughs> uh, I believe, uh, could actually would have ultimately become a, a fusion machine. Uh, the problem with with is you need very hot plasma, and as you heat the the, the plasma is a fully ionized gas, and so as you heat the the, the gas make it into a plasma. I'm talking about confusion. The fusion. Right, the fusion. So the, the, the big problem in making a fusion reactor is that the plasma is diamagnetic, which means that it opposes a magnetic field. So if you put a magnetic field, a, a plasma obeys the laws of fluid dynamics. It's interesting, even though it's, it's a gas. And so... Um, and one of the, as I said, it becomes, as it, the temperature rises, it becomes more diamagnetic. But also, and so being diam diamagnetic, if you have a magnetic field around it, you can, can hold it like in a, in a milk bottle. Except you can't make a magnetic field that's completely uniform. It leaks. And also, when you start to confine plasma, it starts developing instabilities. In other words, it doesn't like to, it's like trying to, to hold jello in your hand and it just squeezes oh, out. Okay. Okay? So this is, so you have to devise a way to, to contain it in the magnetic field. And what I was working on, interesting enough, is that if you start moving the, and the two major instabilities in, in this, um, and the, confining the plasma. One is called a, a, a Taylor instability. A Taylor instability is a constant number with a negative exponent. So if you do it mathematically, as the negative exponent increases, you get a catastrophic failure. It just drops down towards zero and completely collapses. And the other instability is called the Helmholtz instability. Now the Helmholtz instability can be described as having uh, 
the difference between uh, two interfaces, two liquids or semi-liquids. Uh, for example, if you have a flat body of water, like a lake or a pond, and then you start blowing some wind over it, <clears throat> you start getting ripples in the water. Okay. And as the wind starts increasing, the ripples, st ripples start becoming waves. Okay. That is called the Helmholtz instability. So you get all these perturbations on the outside, causing the, the, the plasma to, to cool and hit the walls of the, of the container. And, uh, and when that happens, it's no longer usable? It? No, it's no longer, right, it cools off. You, you need thermonuclear neutrons to interact with, with the nuclei of the, of the plasma in order to make them fuse together to make the, the hydrogen become helium. Now, what I was working on was we did, uh, and again, we had the ability to have a very large computer <coughs> available at the time, and we did some calculations showing that if the plasma became supersonic, uh, that was moved very quickly, in like in a racetrack, that the um, uh, instabilities would drop down to zero. Okay. So if you can make the plasma whip around supersonically, go faster. Um, now it could be in a small loop, right? Yeah, it could be a very small loop. Okay. Which is what I built. I built half a loop showing that I could make it. So that was the arc plug, part of the arc plug? The arc plug was the trigger, right. I have a paper, I should show you a paper right, that I wrote so 1950, whatever it was, in the 50s, yes.